Do you remember we talked about one of the, one of the titles a few weeks ago, about four weeks back, I think, was Are You a Disciple? Do you remember that? And um, it's a challenging question. I've talked to a few people since then that have said, Pastor, I know I'm not a disciple. I, I know I'm not there yet. And I'm like, good, that's, that's great to hear. Now, do you know what you have to do to get there? Uh, no, I don't know what I have to do to get there. And I said, all right, great, keep pressing in, though. Keep looking, keep searching your heart, go, go before the Lord and ask him what it means to be a disciple and how it is that I get from, from where I am to there. Amen? Because we want to be growing forward and advancing the call of what God has in our life. And if you remember when Jesus uh, collected his disciples, when he collected the 12, he actually went out to each one of them and said, you follow me, come with me. And there's no uh, argument of any of the faithful ones that said, well, Lord, <laughs> uh, l- let me get back to you on that. There was no argument. There's no, recommend, there's no uh, argument of, of uh, no record of argument. That's what I was trying to say. There's no record of argument <clears throat> of any of the disciples that uh, Jesus called and that were faithful to him. And so we're entering into a day now where we're saying, uh, there's a lot that God's calling on us for. It's nothing less than before, just we're becoming more aware of it. I think in a lot in a lot of ways. So um, so we're, we're we're pressing forward now. So what does it mean to be a disciple? We we we've had a few definitions uh, in in past weeks. What is what does it mean to be a disciple? Anybody want to make it up? As opposed to, to just being a believer, what does it mean to be a, a disciple? What's that? <laughs> now you have to say it again. Um, the difference between a disciple and just a believer. Um, you're, du- you're duplicating as you're, as you're leading, as you're walking in Christ, you're leading them with you. You're you're bringing them into where you've been, and you're and you're taking what God is teaching you, and you're re- and you're bringing it, and you're you're encouraging somebody else up because from where they're at because you're farther are, along. The disciples are called to make more disciples. Yes, everything in the kingdom of God uh, reproduces <laughs> after its own kind. Correct, and um, <clears throat> that's that's good. You know, I heard it said earlier this week. H- how was it put? That for some of you. You don't want to show up at e- in eternity alone. <laughs> you, know I mean? you don't want to show up before God alone because you're, you're not called to be there alone. You're called to bring others with you. Right? And, and that's a, I think that's a good definition of, of what a disciple is. A disciple is, is somebody who is going to uh, assimilate the kingdom of God and then to procreate the kingdom of God in somebody else. So he, I had Paul say it, you know, until Christ is formed in you. So it's his job as the apostle, as a sent one, to form Christ and others. It's good. Anybody else? The word says that a disciple is one that um, loves God more than family, more than anything else. Yeah, yeah you're more than your mother, your father, your, your uh, spouse, your child. That um, He says unless you uh, hate your mother, your father, your Spouse or your child, you're not, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. You cannot be my disciple, is what Jesus said there. So, anything else? I think um, a disciple is willing to lead by example as well. Right? One who so. leads by example? How about, how about uh, the part where the kingdom of heaven rules in their life? Mm. You know, so, so we bring that rulership of the kingdom. We, we're submitted under the kingdom of God, then through that we rule in the earth. And a disciple being one who has the character of Christ and, and the nature of Christ, who brings the, the character of Christ, which we get from the fruits of the Spirit, and the nature of Christ. Remember the nature of Christ? <clears throat> I think it's so important for us to get that because Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. And so when we grab that nature of Christ, and it's our, our, what we do is that we do the will, our, our, our nature is to do the will of him who sends us. So Christ is sending us, and so our, our nature, what is natural for us to do, the old nature passed away, behold, we have a new nature, and the new nature is to do the will of him who sent us. Sound good? All right. Um, and then <clears throat> I just wanted to also bring 
this up as well, that as we are pressing down into these next few seasons or levels or what it is that we're actually getting into, that we want to really grab hold of what our calling is as far as uh, winning people to Jesus, winning people to Christ, and then training them up for service. We, we prayed about that just a few minutes ago. As people are coming into the kingdom of God, we want to win them for Christ, but then we want to train them as uh, believers, train them as Christians, train them as, as disciples, as servants, and then to, uh, uh, to, to raise them up and, and to put them into action. Amen? Any action-oriented people in here? Amen. Yeah, all right. It's not that late. It's not bedtime. Wake up. All right. Um, I want to follow up with the last one that I taught, um, which was um, uh, seeking or desiring the greatest gift. And we understand the greatest gift is, is love. And we'll get that out of 1 Corinthians 13. But if you're going to follow along with your Bible today, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 27. You got it? So, uh, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12, 7. Paul writes, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that, miracles and gifts of healing and helps and administrations and varieties of tongues. Now, this, um, this is going to be important for us to follow through. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. It, it sure looked a lot bigger from the back of the room than it does from the front. Um, but we, this is what we talked about a few weeks ago. And I just wanna, I want to use this as a baseline for the rest of, of today's teaching. But first, he, he announces first apostles. And as we are looking through these particular uh, gifts, we want to recognize them as gifts and not offices. It's not, it's not like this is the office of an apostle, a prophet, a, 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 a teacher. It's, it's, we want to look at it as this is the gift. These are the spirit working through the saints. So this is the gift that God has put in the body, in the church, in his body uh, for the advancement of his kingdom. Because later on, we're going to talk about what this means to each of us individually and then what it means to us corporately. Okay? All right. First, apostles. What is apostle? An apostle is a sent one. Apostle is somebody who's sent into, even into a, a, a hostile territory. And if you look at what the original meaning of the word apostle is, the apostle is one that would be sent out from a conquering king into a land where he had had... Uh, where he had, had, had won against another king, and his job was to go and to, to bring back everything that had been lost in the battle, everything that had been lost in the, in the struggle. So he went out with, with the king's authority to recover those things which were lost. So first, the apostles. And who are apostles? Apostles are those who are, are sent out. They are builders. They are establishers. Uh, they, are, are in, 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 in biblical terms, have the highest authority in the church. They, they set up structures and, and pull things together and declare what God's will is and, and get some things accomplished. So there's an apostolic um, anointing. There's an apostolic, apostolic uh, gift that gets laid out in the church. Second, it says uh, prophets. And so we understand, we know prophets, somebody who stands up, and they predict the future. They predict the things that are going to happen, or they speak words of, of, of knowledge. They can speak into situations where they would not have any other insight other than God is speaking through them. So in the Old Testament, what was spoken was a whole lot of uh, judgment, a whole lot of instruction, a whole lot of, you know, if you uh, uh, do not do as God has instructed you to do, here's where your... Uh, the curse will be, but if you do what God has told you, here's the blessing, those kinds of things. Now, we're talking about the, the, the gift of, of, of second prophets. It sounds like it should be a book. Turn to second prophets, chapter 5. But <clears throat> here what prophecy means is it's inspired speech, inspired speakers. Your prophets would be preachers. Your prophets would be those who would uh, speak out something that is really, it's the Spirit of God speaking through them. You know, I heard the Lord say, or, 
or um, you know, the Lord just placed this into my spirit, that that's where the, there's a gift of, of prophecy, a gift of the prophet that moves inside the local body. Third, there's teachers. Right? Teachers are, um, yeah, the, the word teacher trans, translates into doctor or master or teacher. Um, but teachers are, are certain individuals who have, um, they have an ability to take complex things and make them very simple. So sometimes we're very simple-minded, and sometimes what God wants to speak is something very complex. A teacher would have a gift of taking that, that, that concept or that idea, bringing it into something uh, uh, temporary, current, people can understand, and then being able to present it in very simple terms so that people can get it and understand it. That's one side of the gift of, of uh, teaching. However, there's another side of that gift as well, and that is to take something that is very simple or that appears to be very simple, and then what they're doing is they're, they're able to bring out the more complex things that are in it. They're able to, to, to kind of brighten up what that lesson is or, or, or what it is that the word is communicating to be able to say, you know, it's, it, it looks like this on one level, but there's actually five different levels or five different ways of bringing it out. Does that make sense? So then you have the, the gift. After that, there's, there's miracles. How many of y'all like miracles? I had uh, uh, one loaf of bread and fed a thousand people. That was a miracle. I had a dollar and I was able to, to do incredible things with that dollar. And that's, that's a miracle, um, that there are things. And, of course, the power of miracles is not to ooh and ow, you, ow us. It's, it's really to encourage our faith. It, it's to, it, it, not only our faith, but also the faith of, of non-believers who would be believers if they can see the power of God in action. And so there, there are some, sometimes God will pour out that anointing to perform miracles. How many of y'all would like to perform a miracle? I just laid hands on that car and started right up, <laughs> you know, uh, the dunamis, the power. So there's a, a gift of miracles. Then it says a, a gift of, of, of healing, the charisma, the gift of, of healings. And, and so we understand you can lay hands on people, pray for them, they can get healed. But also that also means not only a gift of healings, actually more accurately, <clears throat> and I believe to read this up in the King James, it's a gift of cures. It's a gift of solutions. It's a gift of, of, of answers. Just like Jesus, when he, when he sent the man, he put the mud in his eye and he said, go wash in the, in the pool of Siloam, that when that happened, see, Jesus could have just laid hands on him and he would have been healed. But he gave him a cure. And as he told him what he needed to do, he went out, he did it, and he came back seeing. So there's a, a gift of healings. There's also a gift of, of cures. There's wisdom. There's knowledge in it. Um, Next, there's the gift of helps, <clears throat> and uh, we understand sometimes, if you've been around with some of us for a while, we look and we think, well, the gift of helps, that's ushering and, and, and putting cookies out and those kinds of things, and, and actually there's so much more to it, um, but it's the ability to give aid or the ability to give relief, and it's not always you know, financial. Sometimes we think of giving aid or relief, we think it's, it's giving a few dollars, but it's, it's, it's people who will serve, uh, people who give quietly, people who give benevolently. You know, there, there's, there's this gift of, of, um, of helps that certain people move in it phenomenally. And usually they don't get recognized for it at all. <laughs> and they're not looking to be recognized for it. They're just, what are you here for? I'm here to help. Right? And I'm here to help in a supernatural way. There's that which I can do, but then there's that which God has empowered me to do. And again, the purpose for it is not just so people have help, but to help them to believe to build their faith, to extend the kingdom of God. Next up, we have administrations. How many of y'all are glad for administrators? Michelle's not going to look up. I'm looking right at her, and I'm saying, aren't you glad for administrators? And what are administrators? They're not just secretaries. <laughs> you know, they're not, they're not just people who write checks and pay the bills and that kind of thing. But there, there's much more to it. And so administrators are, are, are directors, they're instructors, they give guidance. In some cases, they're, they're counselors. And so, um, so th that's, that's a part of the gift of, of administrations. It's, it's the ability to give instruction that sometimes we just need to make it happen. 
You know, like sometimes we need to make, we got to get the building clean. And the administrators, the one that comes up, okay, you two go down and clean the bathrooms. You two go over there and, and, and do this and that. And we'll have this whole thing done in 10 minutes. That's a gift of administration. That's when you say, well, well, what are we doing? I, I don't know what to do. And you say, well, call Mike. Mike will know what to do. And Mike comes and he starts telling everybody what to do. And there's a gift of, of instruction. You realize that the, 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 the very gift of administration is counseling sometimes. And people come and say, I don't know what to do. What should I do? Here are the five things that you need to do and watch how it will work out. That's a mix if you think about it. It's a gift of, of cures and administrations. This is what you need to do. This is how you get it done. And here are the people who are going to help you get it done. Because sometimes we, we're praying to the Lord. And we're saying, Lord, uh, I, I have a responsibility. I have something I need to get done. You can go right down this list and ask God for the gift that you need. Right? And the last gift here is the varieties of tongues. And we, we kind of broke it down a little bit last week. And the word variety or diversity, actually, it, it imply, those words imply separation or differences. But it's not differences of tongues. It's, it's actually the opposite. It's genos, which means... Um, of the same kindred, of, of the same generations, of the same offspring, of the same nation. That it's, there, there's similarities of tongues. And so we understand the gift of tongues. Maybe we understand them, maybe we don't. But we, but we have uh, tongues that we understand. There's tongues of uh, uh, praying in, the, um, in, in, in our prayer language, which is between us and God. There's, there's uh, sometimes a worship in tongues. We're all kind of singing in those tongues together. But then there's that tongue that you can speak that somebody else can understand. That's a different tongue altogether. And those tongues are there so that people will believe. Just imagine that someday you're up there and you're singing your boom shakalaka and, and there's somebody who speaks that language and says, do you know what you were saying in my home language, in my native tongue? Anybody here, you ever operate in that kind of a tongue before? Well, you don't like know exactly what you're saying but you know that you are communicating something to somebody who understands what you're saying. I've had that happen to me before. I was actually down in the DR. It happened to me two times down there. Wonderful. Spanish, I understood what they were saying. They understood what I was saying. God was glorified. I went home, didn't understand anything that just happened. But it was good. You know, God, God really ministered in those situations. I had a translator. I had to tell him to stay out of it. Stay out of the way. Pressing on for more. Hey, Roseanne's here. Come on in, 1 Corinthians 12. And so you have all of, all of these gifts that are, are available to us as God gives us ability to move in them. And then the Apostle Paul continues and says, so are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? He said, and basically, when he's asking the question, he's saying not everybody operates in every gift, right? But he says, but earnestly desire the best gifts. What do you think he means by that? But earnestly, which means sincerely, desire the best gifts. What do you think that means? The gifts that what? Oh, oh, I was just thinking, gift that benefits the most people, but I don't know. They all benefit people. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, we, the Bible's telling us to, to take an action here. And he's saying, earnestly desire the best gifts. He's, he's, he's telling you what you ought to have an appetite for. Kim? I was going to say the ones that God has called you to operate in would be the best gifts for you personally. Like the one that God has, has called you to operate correct. in. Correct. Would be the best gifts. So seek, so seek the ones that God has called you to in that moment or in that season because that's where God is going to be glorified the most because he's called you to be obedient in that particular. That's good. Anybody else? Could be the gift that's needed right then. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, it's the best gift is going to be the most effective gift. 
it's got to be the most influential gift. The best gift is going to be the one that has the highest impact. So, I mean, the answer is yes, yes, and yes. That's exactly it. It's the gifts that, 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 that are going to have the most impact at that moment or, or maybe over a period of time. And, and he's saying, a, des a desire earnestly the best. It's not the ones who, who get the most attention. I'm sorry, Rosie, were you going to say something? <laughs> I was going to say that the gift that um, would glorify him the most so that to move forward the kingdom, that he be glorified. Mm -hmm. Like, because some gifts are to, uh, you know, help us, like healing. We get healed and we feel all better. And, <coughs> and that's, that is a testimony, sure. But um, gifts that will glorify him, that he would be in the spotlight. Yeah, yeah. That, that, well, and, and that comes back around, the most effective, the most, what, what's, what's really going to help us to move through a situation, what, what really opens up more hearts to receive and, 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 and to get the fullness of what God has in that moment. So we ought to desire earnestly the best gifts. I think that's why he doesn't specify what the best gift is, because the best gift is going to shift and move according to uh, scenarios and situations. And then he says, you know, yet I'll show you a more excellent way. And what he's saying there, is, we went through this last time, I don't want to go through the whole thing again, but what he's, he's getting at here is that a love is important. That the, gift, the very gift, whatever it is that you are operating in, if love is not in it, it will not stand. It, it, it's not going to be effective. It's not going to last over time if it is not operating in a, uh, a benevolent, agape love. So in other words, I could have gift of prophecy. I, I, I could, I could uh, have that apostolic gift to go in. I could have the administrations. I could have all of these things. But if you're just operating inside of a can or inside of a box, it's not going to last. It's not going to have a great impact. But if it's motivated by love, why did you do what you did? Because I, I, I love God. I, I love people. I, I love God's people. And so, therefore, it motivates me to, to keep going and, and to operate in this gift. And I think there's something very powerful if we can grab onto why it is that we do what we do. Sometimes we do stuff we hate. Anybody here? Sometimes God calls you to do stuff you hate. Maybe the people you don't like, you have to love them, but it doesn't mean you have to like them. Nowhere in the Bible they say you must go like everybody. But you do have to have love towards them. You do have to have that agape, bene, and I'm, I'm not expecting anything in return kind of love. You know, so I think cleaning the church is a great example. Sometimes we hate cleaning the church. You know, sometimes you're not in the mood. Well, but to tell you what, so when I clean, I do the chairs in here, I pray over every chair while I'm doing it. That's right. I put a little envelopes out. I, I pray over those envelopes. I pray over the people. I pray. You know, I'm not cleaning if I'm not praying. Sometimes Ben say, I put my headphones in and I'm just, hey, 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 just singing or listening to a sermon in my ear or something that's motivating and getting me going, getting me fired up. And, and that's how I, I, I demonstrate even something that's behind the scenes is done with love. I, I love preaching, but I, I really don't enjoy the preparation time. I mean, it's, 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 it's miserable time for me. I mean, I, I, don't get me wrong, I'm not complaining. But I'll tell you what, what keeps me going, what pushes me, what drives me to keep doing the research and build it up, it's not about what I say, it's about what's heard. It's about what's caught. It's about what's, how impactful that can be. So it doesn't matter what we're doing in the kingdom of God. I'm sure it's the same thing with the kids. Someday them kids must, must drive you up and absolutely up the wall. But you do it in love, <laughs> you know, but you, you do it in love and you ask God to heal you later, you know, but you, you, you press on and, and, and you, everything done in love is really effective. Music ministry sometimes, I'm sure that can be a drag, you know, but you know what? I, I'm here and I'm ministering love and that's why we can't ever say, <laughs> I don't care what you all came to do. This is what I came to do today. That doesn't work in the kingdom of God. You better care what we came here to do. We came, we came here to worship God, and, and I didn't come here so that three or four people can worship. I came here so we can all worship God together. Amen? And so if we catch that's the, the mentality behind what we're doing and how it is that we're serving, and we realize love makes it all effective. Without love, it's just a performance. You know what happens after the performance? Everybody forgets it. You know? It, it has no impact. So I want you to turn now to Romans chapter 12, and that's where we're going to be. Lucky I love you. 
Romans chapter 12. Keeping those gifts in mind as we just ran through that, that list. And we'll bring the list up a little bit later as well. I was going to put it on a handout. Maybe I should have. But for now, Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Are you ready? All right. Paul writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I like that. That, that is a powerful verse. I, I want to stop there just for a moment. It says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is reasonable service. There's a difference here between a disciple and a believer. And the first part is simply this, presenting yourself, holy, acceptable to God. And that's, it's just like, that's base level right there. That's reasonable. That's not exceptional service. That's reasonable. And, and you realize what he's saying here? The first step of what you must do, you want to be my disciple? First step of what you must do is not by what God is going to do. It's what you're going to do by brute force. It's what you're going to do by determination. You know, with God's help, I can get this done, but God is saying, I will help you get it done. I won't do it for you. That is one of the biggest challenges. Ben and I was at a meeting Monday night, and these guys were talking about not being able to do the bare minimum in their lives and not even trying, not even going to make an attempt at it. This was their testimony. I don't have to. How about get up and walk out? It's your reasonable service to begin. It's the denial of the flesh. It, it, I'm not, it's, it's not like denying my body something to eat. <laughs> it's denying the flesh its way because we're not going to be ruled by the earth anymore. We're not going to be ruled by heaven. I'm going to become a disciple. All right? Acceptable to God. It's my reasonable service. I'm denying impurity of my flesh. I'm denying the very things that God said is not good for me to have because that's carnal, and God has now called me to walk by the Spirit. Does that make sense? That's, 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 that's roughneck preaching 101. You, you're going to have to get off your butt and do some work for the kingdom of God. And then the second step, and do not be conformed to the world. That's a hard one. I was born in this world. All I know is this world. And I'm already conformed to the world. <laughs> but here, I'm going to break that, 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 that conformity and not be conformed to the world, but to be transformed, to become new. To be, it doesn't say transform your mind. It says be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect or the complete will of God. Now I'm going to give you what you've been waiting for. Your first point. Disciples must have a renewed mind. Disciples must have. We, we, we have to think differently. We have to, be, we have to, to, to think differently to, to become disciples. See, disciples are to be the example of what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That, that's a, if you can't remember the whole verse, just remember good, acceptable, and perfect. The good, acceptable, and the perfect will of, of God. It says, it says here that, that you are to uh, prove, to test what is the good, the acceptable, the perfect will of God. Uh, it, I, I've heard that called, that's the other meaning of the gap theory. Good, acceptable, and perfect. Good, acceptable, perfect will of God. The original apostles first became disciples before becoming apostles. Before they walked into the gifts, before they began to operate, before they, they, they walked into anything deeper, they first became the disciples of Jesus. And it was a struggle, and it was a fight, and that's why they were constantly fighting, even amongst themselves. Who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of God? So in, their, in their discipleship, they were going through the fight and going through a process. They were being transformed. They were breaking out of an old conformity into what the kingdom of God is becoming. And remember, that couldn't even be complete until the Holy Spirit came. 
We're going to become renewed and become disciples. To live the disciple life, the disciplined life. A renewed mind. It's a new way of thinking. You know, how do you know when your mind's been renewed? Anybody here you would say your mind has been renewed? I'm not going to call on you, but would you say you had a renewed mind? If I said I was not going to call on you, then would you put your hand up? All right. <laughs> what do you mean by that then? No. And, and just, just to realize that, that it, it, a, a, a different way of, of thinking. I, how many of you, like, you're coming to the kingdom of God and you're saying, I'm just waiting for God to do something in my life? You ever been there? It's God, I'm just waiting for you to do something. Right? And, and then maybe the shift of the renewed mind is, Lord, I'm waiting to do something. Instead of I'm waiting for you to do something in me, I'm waiting to be put into service. I'm waiting to, to be put to work for the kingdom of God. There's so many people that are waiting for God to do something uh, in my family. or I want my family to become this. Or would we be looking for our families to do something for God? And that's what we're looking for. I'm not looking to, for, for God to do the miracle. I'm looking to become the miracle. I'm looking to become the testimony. I'm looking to become an example, a proven example of what is a good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Then you're making a shift from what you're trying to get out of God, and then you're actually putting on Christ and engaging deeper into the kingdom of God. That's some good preaching right there. I tell you, I'd amen myself. I was thinking about from Sunday, part of Sunday's message. I said, if we follow Christ, he leads us out of the pit. Right? If we follow him, if we become followers, we, 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 uh, he takes us up out of the pit, pits of despair and of heaviness and of poverty and depression and failure and exhaustion. That, that's a lot of people I know that are in those pits. But when we become disciples, we can be in the pit and still have joy and peace and hope. As a matter of fact, as a disciple, I can be put into the pit and then rule the pit. You know, like, you want me to get you out of there? I'm not finished killing all the demons yet. I'm going, to, I'm going to rule this pit. I'm going to claim this pit for the kingdom of God instead of trying to just escape it. Amen? Verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Actually, King James Version says not a measure of faith, but it says the measure of faith. Everybody has been given the measure of faith. Whatever is required of faith, you already have it. So as disciples, we're looking at it, what Paul is saying here, think soberly. Um, uh, don't think more highly uh, of, of himself, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one. In other words, don't put yourself first. In your walk as a, as a disciple, it's not all about you. It's not about, all about what it is that you are going to accomplish. It's not about you. It's not about your reputation. It's, it's, not, it's not about you feeling good about yourself and others feeling good about you. As a disciple, you're there and you're driven by a purpose that is bigger than you. And so you put other people first. You, you, you humbly serve and you humbly submit to God. And that is what being a disciple is really all about. I was thinking about, remember in John chapter 4, when uh, they, they walked into the village in Samaria? And, and, and Jesus said, go find something to eat. Go away. Because there's a woman that was coming, and he wasn't looking to have a date. But she came, and, and Jesus ministered to this woman. And the disciples came back and said, what are you talking to her for? They had already put themselves up higher than this woman. And then they started asking Jesus, did, you have any, did she give you anything to eat? He said, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. I have, I have something that you don't even yet understand. But for us to, to, to realize that as disciples, it's not about us getting our, our place and our position for ourselves personally. If anything, if I am striving for a position, if I am striving for a, a, a place, uh, uh, and, and, and these things should all be to the glory of God, not for the glory of self. If I'm doing it, it's because that's where God has called me to get to so that I can uh, be effective and use the gifts that God has given me to operate in the place that he's called me to operate. That way, obviously, I'm de desiring the best gift. See, it's coming back around, isn't it? Verse 4 says, As 
<clears throat> For as we have many members in one body, but not all members, uh, but all the members do not have the same function. They do not have the same office. Uh, so we being many are one body in Christ and, and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in ministering, which means to attend or it means to serve. If, 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 if my, my gift is in ministry, uh, um, let me do it according to my measure of, 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 of faith. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy, let him do it with cheerfulness. As, as, you, as you read through that, you realize, so, so first of all, he's saying we are all members individually, but we are also all members corporately. And so there's a, a, a giving out, there's a dispensation of gifts by God's grace, which we understand that's his mercy and his empowerment, but also in proportion to the measure of faith that we have. Or in other words, you're called to do something. Everybody here is a called probably to do multiple things. We're a small church. We need a lot of people to do a lot of different things. And so, but we can, we can operate in excellence and according to the measure of faith. What are we applying to our level of service? How much do we actually, are, are, are we praying, are we praying, are, are declaring what God says we can do, or are we um, uh, declaring to God what it is that we can do? I can only do but so much. I, don't, don't ask me to do any more than, than, than just this. Everybody should know that I only have this much resource, this much energy, strength, and whatever. That's giving our bare minimum. That, by definition, is pride because you just told God everything that you're capable of instead of listening to what he says you're capable of. There's something more. There's something bigger. There's something better. And we're supposed to be doing this together. Amen? In verse 6, that having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. And, and so the, but the second thing, if you want to write, write down a point here, is this. Disciples are not clones. Disciples are not clones. As a matter of fact, Many of the disciples that walked with Jesus had the same name. <laughs> but they were all given different names so you could distinguish who they are as he was talking about because they were all differing. Every one of them had personalities. Every one of them had issues. Disciples are not clones. In other words, they do not have the same DNA, but they share DNA. You're not a clone. Don't expect everybody to do exactly what you did at the pace that you did it. And don't expect that you can keep pace with everybody else. And don't think because somebody else is moving slow that you have to move slow too. That there's an advancement, there's a growth, there's some things. Not all gifts are going to be, be the same. I don't expect anybody to do everything that I'm doing because if everybody's doing everything that I'm doing, then nobody's doing the stuff that I don't do. So we're working together. For good, so we're not clones. And I say we share DNA because we all share the DNA of Christ. We all have that. However, we also have variances. We have differences. And we need to be able to celebrate what those differences are and leverage where our strengths are and let somebody else leverage where our weaknesses are. So we're working together. Well, imperfection. And I like to, here, here's something else you can write down if you're taking notes. Disciples are designed to work together. Disciples are designed. God has designed us. Different personalities, different backgrounds, different histories, maybe different futures. But for today, <laughs> we're all joined together. We're all working together. We are designed to work together, to be in unity, to be in concert one with another so whatever is happening you know all all points of the body are providing all points are working together so we see that that excellence is, as we're coming together as disciples we're not clones but we're designed to work together and 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 you can add right to that disciples are not only designed to work together they are the word is gifted gifted to work together your gifts are different from my gifts there's, there's gifts that you're going to have that will be amplified. 
and they will accentuate the other gifts in the house so that we are working together uh, uh, completely, getting more accomplished together. If we're not working well together, we are not working, uh, operating well together, uh, we're not working according to our design purpose. Think about that. If we can't get it together, we can't work together, then we're not doing what God has designed us to do. Uh, we're not working together according to our giftings, that God has given us giftings to work together. And, and, and when it's all working together, boy, you can really tell. A, boy, I really sense the presence of God today. That's because everything was working together. The body was working well together. God is glorified and, and, and present and in our midst and empowering us. Remember, if we're faithful with a little, he'll make a ruler over much. So, so I only got a little gifting today. See, that's my, my, big, my big day is coming. There, there's, there's more that is required. There's, there's something more that is coming. And I know it's coming because we're working together, because we're using the gifts that we have. Amen? So if we're not working together uh, according to our gift, we're not working our gifts together, it doesn't mean we should give up. It doesn't mean we should get up and walk out. It doesn't mean that we say, you know what, uh, I, I, you know, I, I really got a gift to do this and that. And, and, and Pastor Dave won't let me on the platform to do my thing. I said, I quit. I'm leaving. I'm going to go find a church where they will let me do it. Uh, chances are, if that's your thing, you might find a church that's going to let you do it, but you will never reach your potential of where it is. That you, unless you're doing what God has called you to do, you're never going to reach your potential. So don't quit. Don't give up. But what we ought to be doing is sharpening our gifts. If God has spoken to you, so you know, I have a, a gift. If you're going to be a, a teacher, then, then what are you doing with that today to get ready for tomorrow? What, what is it that's coming down the pike that's coming ahead? And are you sharpening that gift? I mean, uh, as, as I think Amy was praying or somebody was praying in, in the prayer, that there, there are people who are called to do different things, but yet these posts remain vacant because I don't feel like I'm called to do that, and, and I don't want to do that, and I don't like kids or this. And I said, wait a minute, but God has called you to this post and this time and in this season. So not only so the kids are blessed, praise God. I mean, where's the love in that if, if the kids aren't, aren't blessed by it? Right? Imagine if we had to have the kids out here in the sanctuary every single week. They would not get much out of the sermon. Some of them would. Some of them might get too much out, go home and, and wreck the house. But most of them need to be taught by somebody who can represent information on their level so they can get it into their heart. Be ready to grow up. Be ready to move forward. You know, how hard is it for somebody who's never been in church to walk into a church at 18 or 19, 21, 25 years old, walk into a church and say, man, I really feel like this is where I belong. So wait a minute. If you weren't there when you were young, you might not get there when you're older. I was thinking about this earlier today. I was saying, if I was not a Christian, if I was not saved, what would it take for somebody to bring me into the kingdom of God today? You ever, you ever wonder that? What would it take to get me in the door to the kingdom of God? What would it take me to get me to church where I would actually sit and listen and humble myself and be able to receive what's happening there? I don't know. I was thinking about this. When would I even talk to you? <laughs> only, only way you're going to get to me is, 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 is if I was on the job or somehow we ended up at a dinner party together. And even then I might not come. I know who I was. I know where I was. I, I know how I can be. And I said, wow, that, that's, that's pretty tight. What, is, what does that mean? That means that if anybody was going to win me, we probably had to work together. That means somebody better do some marketplace ministry because there's people like me that need to be able to hear from some of you all. Amen? Where else? What other times? What other places? I mean, and you know what? And, and the other thing is the only reason why I was really open was because I was raised in the church, not in a lively church, not in a church where I was receiving the word of God, but I was raised up to serve in the church. And so that opened up a door for, for me to long for it when I got older. So there's some things you have to realize. And, and so what actually kept me in the church? Discipleship did. Fellowship did. The people who wanted to uh, now impart the word of God into me even though I didn't want it at that time. I just wanted to come and sing songs and dance and feel like I was holy. And they said, you ain't holy till you finish this book right here. I'm, like, I, I'm not reading your book. Now, the Bible I'll read, but I'm not going to read that thing. And, you know, and, and so there was a lot that, that actually took place, but that discipleship, there was the one-on-one, -on -one, there was the group, the pastor that invested into me, 
uh, right after I got saved, there was a lot of things that came together. We had a small group way back before anybody did small groups. We play tennis one week and sit around and talk about the Bible another week, and that's and that's how we um, got secure in the things of the Word of God. So the, the uh, disciples are gifted to work together. That's the point I'm on. And, and if you go down to verse nine, Paul continues, "Let love be without hypocrisy. Uh, abhor what is evil. That means to hate." But, but hate wasn't a strong enough word, so you had to say abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another. You say, the, the, grab the corporate unity thing here. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, Philadelphia, in order, I'm sorry, in honor, giving preference to one another. That's a pretty big one right there. No, I insist. You first. No, I insist you. It's not about me. It's, 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 it's about you today. Why don't you, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, being fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now, mind you, all of those things are about doing it together. It's all about doing it together. Amen? Verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Isn't that powerful? And here we're doing all of this. See, when this, this is all a part of the transformation. This is all a part of the renewing of the mind. This is all a part of transforming and becoming new. And this is all a part of, of even shifting from a simple I believe into the place of saying I'm walking and following Christ. I'm walking into the place of discipleship. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Do you see the togetherness thing here? It's not about being in isolation. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. And do not be wise in your own opinion. Well, there's some challenging stuff right there. Associate with the humble and don't be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. That's a key verse right there if possible which means it's not always possible but if as much as it depends on you live peaceably with all men live peaceably with all people i notice a lot of people don't want to live peaceably with all people but as a disciple we're commanded to beloved do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. Don't avenge yourself. I'm going to go get that guy. I'll punch him right in the mouth. I hope they fall apart. Yeah, there's a, a video that's going viral out there where uh, the, the person in the video is proclaiming judgment and death on drug dealers and and, and, and all these different things, and it's, it's gone absolutely crazy viral. And I looked at it, I said, it's completely unscriptural. I like what he had to say, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't line up to Scripture. This is not what God has called us to do. We're supposed to be living peacefully. We are supposed to be coming against things like drugs and, and issues and things like that, but it is not our place to pronounce judgment and death on anybody. We should be praying for them to come to the Lord. Amen? And praying for God to send the right people out to, to be invasive in, in the uh, kingdom of darkness. Take the kingdom by force. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire upon his head. Now, that doesn't mean that when you feed them, when you give them something to drink, that their head's going to catch on fire and, and they're going to burn to death. And, and all these, That's not what that means at all. But think about this. It, it's going to cause coals to land on their head. Holy, righteous coals. It's going to start to change the way that they think. It's going to mess with their 
understanding. It's good. They're going to feel the love of God. And you know what happens when you do that? You might be just converting your enemies into friends, your foes into allies. Remember that prophetic word? And, 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 and by, by being good to your enemy, don't be a sucker. All right, nowhere in the Bible does it say be a sucker. That's not what it says here at all. But it says here, it, it, it doesn't say that to tolerate people being abusive in your life. That's not what this means at all. What it's saying is somebody is hating on you, do something kind instead of vengeance. And, and let God be glorified. Prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Because it's not about you. You humbly submit to the things of God. Amen? Matter of fact, he said, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. In doing so, you will heap coals of fire upon his head. And you realize here Paul is quoting uh, a Proverbs, but he didn't quote the whole verse. Because of Proverbs 25, 22, it continues and it says, and the Lord will reward you. You, you, you follow the whole thing. If your enemy's hungry, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For doing so, you'll heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord will reward you. Verse 21 says, Do not over, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So living uh, as a disciple, you are partaking in the building, the policing, and the preservation of the kingdom of God. I, by, by doing all of these things, what you're doing is you're bringing the kingdom of God outward. As somebody is standing out there and saying, Pastor Dave, I absolutely hate you and everything that you represent. And I can say, yeah, but I love you and God loves you. And, and, uh, you, know, and, and, and you don't know if you're, if you're converting your enemies into friends, you're actually building the kingdom of God. Don't you hate it when your enemy gets saved? <laughs> Not if they can kill you. It's like, hey, praise God, they got saved. You know, there's plenty of Herods out there. There's plenty of, of those out there that would love to destroy what we represent and love to destroy who we are. But what happens when they get saved? You take all of, of, of their resources. You take all of their energies. You take all the stuff that, that they want to do harm with. You know, you convert that to use for the kingdom of God and the people resource. I'll take it. But in living as a disciple, you partake in the building, the policing, and the preservation of the kingdom of God. As disciples, God has called us to so much more. It's not just existing. It's not just living. It's not just, it's, it's not, it's not just that. You've actually come on board with, with, with a building principle, with a building capability. And then God gives us all of the gifts that we talked about, the, the apostles, the prophets, and, 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 and miracles, and, and, and the signs, and the, and, the, and the wonders, and the administration, and the helps, and all of these things. God gives us the tools to build his kingdom. You just have to have a disciple uniform and a checkout card to get at him. Amen? Hey, everybody. Uh, Pastor David here. I hope you all enjoyed this teaching as much as I did. At this point in the teaching, we uh, actually went in to start to look at some discovery questions that we broke up into small groups. And for the sake of the recording, I wanted to get this, this out for you. Um, the, the title of the, the message was Gifted Together and to recognize the importance of using our gifts, operating in our gifts, and then allowing our gifts to complement and to work together with the gifts that are operating inside of other people. And so the, the questions for discussion that were laid up was, number one, what gifts do you seek? What are the gifts that you desire? What are the gifts that God could bestow upon you that would help you to accomplish your current task, your current mission? The second question is, what are the gifts that you currently have? What are the gifts that you're currently moving in? And then number three, how can you integrate your gifts into your calling as a disciple of Christ? So I hope you enjoyed the message. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me by email or catch me on Sunday or on a Wednesday night so we can discuss it as a group. God bless you. Have a great day.